<laughs> Just so you believe that they, I'm not making any. Okay, uh, welcome uh, everyone uh, to this um, workshop, discussion, diptych, uh, lecture on Marxism and psychoanalysis um, Alliance or Conflict from Soviet Psychology to the Present. I'm um, Alberto Toscano, co-director of the Center for Philosophy and Critical Thought. Uh, and um, before I introduce our speakers, just a couple of announcements uh, just about events that will be happening in the next uh, couple of weeks. So on uh, the 5th and 6th of June, as in next week, we have our um, conference on Baudelaire and philosophy. That's a two-day, all-day uh, conference, um, the 5th and the 6th, mm -hmm. so that's Wednesday and Thursday, I believe, um, with a host of uh, international speakers, including uh, Alyssa Marger, uh, Jennifer Bajorek, um, Adrian Murkigan, uh, and others. Um, and on the 10th, there will be a talk by Kevin McLaughlin called Philology of Life on Dr. Benjamin's Literary Criticism. And then on the 21st, which I believe is last day term, uh, a dialogue between David Lloyd and Lucy Mercier and David's most recent book, Under Representation the Racial Regimes of Aesthetics, I think is the, the subtitle. So I'm um, very happy uh, to have Kathy uh, Shukrov and Sama Tonzic here with us uh, to discuss this topic. This was a um, as part of a project that I believe is maybe it's a, yeah. can... Well, uh, it's part of the Marie Curie Fellowship Research Dissemination Work okay. Package. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> very important, work package. So it's not even a symposium, it's a work package, okay. So, so a, a big profit here yeah. for, for the management. But no, it's kidding, but um, well, uh, so my framework is connected with the research, and uh, I was uh, decide I decided to invite someone to collaborate with me because we had a long debate about how to treat alienation in capitalist and non-capitalist societies. Anyway, um, uh, I'm really grateful that um, the Center for Philosophy and Critical Thought and Alberto hosted us. And yeah, here. so I'll give a quick uh, quick introduction. Uh, so um, Samo uh, teaches at, um, and researches at Humboldt University in Berlin. Uh, he is uh, the author of The Capitalist and Conscious, Marx and Lacan, for the first in 2015, and of another volume that came out in 2019 called The Labor of Enjoyment Toward a Critique of Liberal Economy. Uh, Kenty teaches at the Department of Cultural Studies at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow and has uh, authored a number of texts on art theory and philosophy, including a book called To Be, To Perform, Theater in Philosophic Critique of Art. Now, as you'll have seen from the blurb, the remit of the afternoon is really to explore the relationship between um, Soviet psychology and Soviet critiques or critiques mm -hmm. of psychoanalysis taking place in uh, uh, the Soviet era, especially uh, in the mm -hmm. you know, 1930s, but also after, uh, in relation to the theoretical and philosophical interrogation of the relationship between Marxism and psychoanalysis. Uh, in the 1970s, but also all the way into the present and into the kind of debates that uh, uh, Samo himself has made such a, a contribution to more uh, recently. So the structure uh, of this will be that Petty will speak for around 40 minutes, uh, then Sam will speak for around 40 minutes, and then we'll just have a uh, general uh, discussion around the things that have uh, emerged. Okay. So without further ado. Let's start. Uh, well, um... Oh, by the way, do you want me to tell you if you do any time uh, notice, or, uh, or, or, or are you...? Okay, well, if you feel that I'm too much already okay. somewhere, then, okay. then give right. me a notice, right. yeah. Uh, let's start. Uh, well, uh, this decision to have a session is part of my research, uh, because um, I have recently finished 
a book which is not yet published um, exactly on the issues of <clears throat> how certain emancipation theories work in uh, socialist context, in the context of the political economy of planned and distributive economy, and how they would function in capitalist context, even when capitalist context in, inscribes in itself resisting, resisting theories. Uh, and uh, uh, the issue of the libidinal, the issue of the surplus value, enjoyment, all this psychoanalytical lexicon is extremely important uh, for the context because the main thing that happens in the socialist political economy is that successfully or unsuccessfully surplus economy and libidinal economy is somehow castrated and sequestered. So my research was how to deal with the political economy of shortage and distribution and what is the production of, uh, what is the outcome and result of the economy of delibidinized production. Uh, and someone deals with these issues as well, how it would function, whether it would produce the delineated areas, uh, to what extent they would be criminalized or forceful. Mm, but anyway, I would like to start, because the, 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 the first um, uh, argument immediately uh, which I receive at any discussion is that, come on, stop it. Uh, this is not um, uh, this is not non libidinal economy. Uh, there was market, there was state capitalism, uh, there was alienation. Of course, this is uh, relatively right. But I want to remind you um, that um, well, I disagree with this um, statements, uh, and I think that they start from Althusser's book on critique, and then they are uh, uh, supported by. Um, Balibar's dictatorship of proletariat, where they claimed that socialism was simply some kind of deviated form of, of capitalism. Well, this is to a certain uh, ex extent uh, acceptable, but um, what we see in the production, in the form of object, in the form of the commodity, uh, in the body production, gender production, sexuality production in the context of distributive economy gives us completely different sociological uh, results. And therefore, um, uh, I will try to show you that we cannot rely on those books when we come to the experience of the Soviet socialism. And my first parable, a little bit to seduce you, uh, would be... Um, 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 a, a little uh, example from theology. Uh, in Orthodox theology, uh, as you know, um, hell doesn't have any location. So, um, what in patristics uh, the theolog theologians <coughs> are telling is that uh, what is hell actually? Hell is the situation when you have not uh, when you didn't get rid of your desires, of your libidinal aspirations, you have this phantasmatic desire to exert enjoyment, to feel enjoyment, but all of a sudden you get into paradise. And you simply, in the paradise, don't have the body to exert this desire. So, what is hell? The hell is not that you are punished and shifted somewhere uh, just because uh, you... Um, I don't know, violated certain rules, but it is the condition when desires sustain and the organs and material uh, organics and body to implement this desire is absent. So this is to a certain extent the condition which we have to envisage when we imagine socialist condition when uh, uh, the um, desire, the capitalist subject, is still maybe existing, but the forceful and um, rigid uh, uh, economics, which is criminalizing the surplus, uh, makes it impossible to exert those um, forms of enjo enjoyment and uh, desire. So how this mutated situation can function. Um, and, uh, okay, I start um, uh, with uh, uh, 
important uh, tradition which we have in the philosophy of 60s uh, and one functional paradox in theories of emancipation since Althusser, uh, which becomes um, extremely and especially evident in Judith Butler's theory of psychics and gender composition, uh, uh, itself very much influenced by Althusser's theory of subject and Foucault's theory of sexuality. So according to this paradoxic logic, the subject is subjugating itself uh, by virtue of creating itself. And then this logic goes through all most important emancipatory theories of the 60s. Similar logic goes for desire and sexuality. Without the control of desire, why one cannot acquire and forge that very desire. Without clinical surveillance of sexuality, as we have in Foucault, one cannot acquire the lexicons of sexual enjoyment. Uh, the same is Castoriadis. Um, uh, phantasm is a negative force of the imaginary and the unconscious, but it is unsurmountable because it is at the same time uh, creative potentiality. Uh, uh, the same logic of this mu uh, mutation of negativity and uh, emancipation we have in uh, Lacan and Zizek, because here the sublime categories are already cracked. And, and the very absolute itself is this rupture. Uh, and uh, I think that Samo's book, in a way, prolongs this uh, brilliant tradition uh, because he, he shows that enjoyment is negative, it is alienating, but um, uh, it has to be productive too, and Samo shows very well how production functions within alienation and uh, this obsession, on, uh, obs obsessive thanatography of enjoyment. So uh, in this um, uh, logic, uh, uh, there is this Möbius double bind uh, context of the sociality. Sociality is negative. It is the side that subordinates the individual. Yet it, at the same time, this negative sociality is the playground to display the acts of emancipation. It is uh, because of such ambivalence of social fields that, for example, Butler emphasizes the double bind genealogy of the subject and searches for the remainder of social space free from subjugation and apparatuses. And this free uh, remainder is the gendered body and the psychic dimension. But what is this psychic and gender dimension that has to be devoid of apparatuses and at the same time able for emancipation. It's clinical. So again, I refer to Samo who says that clinical is political. And this is also a great neg negatively, negatively uh, conceived problem that the only politi po political potential uh, has to be clinical. It means that in the realm of psyche and individual body subversions, uh, it, is, it means that it is only in the realm of psyche and individual body subversions one can resist the power uh, discourse. But the question is how to extend such solipsist resistance in the frame of clinics into the commons. As theorized by Butler, the notion of psychics uh, and gender bears the imprint of such clinical solitariness and uh, then gender genealogy uh, is the twofold process of subjugation and emancipatory yearning, but this yearning is generated as a result of initial loss of the other. So why sociality is negative? Because the other is lost. And it is due to narcissistic internalization of such loss that we have this double blind logic of solipsism and um, internalization of the other and um, uh, uh, the, the deadlock of, uh, of, of the affirmative um, uh, marking of the sociality. So sociality is emancipatory, but it is marked negatively. Uh, although Butler tries to reconnect the melancholic individual with the other in the social stratum, such an attempt remains speculative and insufficiently active. So, uh, society is the realm of others, the realm that had not been invented by me. The realm where the other is either alien or is lacking as against my psychic life and gender composition, 
with which, within which the imaginary other can be internalized or discarded. This is the reason why the big other, the ideal, the common, are regarded to be symbolic impositions which colonize the psyche and then the subject tries to resist such uh, colonization. Thus we return to the idea of sociality as the double bind category, the realm where one can enact the performance of freedom, but at the same time it remains the site of coercion and alienation by the token of it being external and alien to the uh, individual. And then what remains here is the performative subversion. Uh, uh, you have to transgress uh, the power uh, apparati by means of a subversive performative um, behavior. Uh, so it is in this negative sense that psychics, gender, enjoyment, and alienation, and, uh, 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 and its libidinal parameters can be considered socially uh, productive. But what happens that we find ourselves in use value economics? And not to lose time, I will be just immediately making certain judgments and you, then you can just uh, um, dispute and just argue with me. So in the conditions of use value economics and evicted private property, conversely, the point of departure is affirmative, constructivist sociality. What comes prior to me is the diacro uh, diachrony of society created by others. And it's, it's not necessary consi necessarily considered to be a negative ideological force of apparatus apparatuses to be subverted. On the contrary, sociality as something that is beyond me <coughs> amplifies and constructs uh, the subject. Why? Because all common good is already in the social structure. Common good is not in subject but it is in the system. And system is more, um, more ethical, more productive. Uh, it is somehow, it is having advantages. Uh, it is more perfect than any uh, citizenship that uh, functions in it. Uh, so it is only via the social genesis that the subject's consciousness is positive and the realm of sociality uh, thus is not the site where inevitable loss of others is demonstrated, uh, and uh, where in emancipation is posited negatively as the demonstration of such laws. Um, uh, so, it's not the lack uh, that in Freudian sense that is the problem of such a society, the lack of the other, um, uh, the uh, lack within the enjoyment procedure, uh, the insaturable uh, libidinal uh, drive, but uh, the problem of such society is the excess, the tragedy of excess of the acquired. So imagine, I gave you this paradise parable, you already have everything. Whatever you have is already there. Even if it's extreme poverty, it's pleroma. Uh, then the problem is not the, not the lack of communism, and my allegation is that even the deterioration of such socialism is not due to the lack of communism, but exactly due to excessive, too much communist elements in socialism. So this goes completely counter to what happened in the interpretation of socialism in the 60s, 70s, in Althusserian and post Althusserian uh, thought. Then, what is the resisting element? to be communist or to be socialist? What is the political agency then? You are not transgressing this apparatus, but you are stretching to it. So it's completely different, even anthropological move. So not transgressing or subverting, but uh, trying to fit it. So you all either fit this paradise, or you are dissident, and or you have those desires that make this paradise hell for you. Um, and, um, well, you, of course, know uh, one of the most seminal works uh, of Lyotard, The Bidinal Economy, um, and, of course, his work goes uh, into the same uh, pleiad or, or chain which I already enumerated, 
But Leo Tarr's book is so important because he's not only depicting uh, this form of um, detesting um, libidinal economy, but at the same time uh, being seduced uh, by it and temptation. Uh, uh, um, uh, and he gives almost literary fictional understanding of the despair of how capitalist subject uh, uh, suffers in, in this condition. So on the one hand, um, uh, we are uh, invested into capital's production, uh, and our libidinal pulsions happen to be in tune with this economy, so we are unconsciously invested in it, and this is manifest in various forms of our behavior. Uh, exchange production, uh, but when we start to criticize this condition, the problem is that uh, the critique cannot free us from those capitalist pulsions. So the problem is that even when we are the critics of capitalism, the libidinality of capitalism does not free us from being capitalist subjects. And uh, 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 therefore, uh, uh, a very important construction in this logic is that to deprive the economy of its libidinal resource is always even more terrible than suffering from this libidinal resource. And Lyotard is showing this, that on the one hand, this is part and parcel of this capitalist surplus economy, but if we deprive ourselves from desire and libidinality which construct capitalism, this would imply termination and castration of desire altogether, and getting rid of the vicious part of libidinality would also get uh, would also terminate the potential for, for creative fervor. That's why it's important that libidinality and libidinal economy sustains, because it is uh, uh, the part and parcel of constructing surplus economy, but at the same time uh, it can deteriorate and forcefully uh, eliminate uh, uh, the, the, the creative potential of the uh, libidinal and of alienation, of course. So um, uh, then my um, goal is to uh, again come and describe this fantastic condition uh, where surplus is criminalized uh, or, or, uh, and where uh, libidinality is not forbidden, of course, because uh, we know that the socialist societies were not based on um, desired economy or attractivity of, of, of consumption. Um, uh, yet, um, uh, um, my goal is to show how all uh, the terms and notions such as consciousness, sexuality, uh, surplus, language, pleasure, uh, they are turned head over heels uh, in the conditions of post-libidinal uh, political economy and check whether it happens by means of imposition uh, from party uh, <coughs> nomenclature or government, because the main idea is that uh, the socialist world lives like uh, all other middle class, uh, petty bourgeois um, um, uh, society, but there are some crazy bureaucrats who are just uh, imposing certain restrictions to this and this, and this layer of life. Um, um, I, I think uh, this is also erroneous because uh, you can see if you look at it, uh, uh, if you look on consumption forms and what happens by the end of 60s, 70s in the stagnation period of Brezhnev, how these um, uh, outcomes of the um, sequestered um, counter libidinal economy, they tell on bodies, tell on cultural production, tell on textures and, and produce uh, some kind of uh, new type of not only ontology, but as I allege, new type of ontics. And uh, I will start from consciousness and go through like consciousness, sexuality, and language probably. Uh, well, uh, uh, what was the uh, main uh, rebuke uh, uh, to, to the unconscious uh, uh, and how to uh, 
reaffirm consciousness in the situation when there was such a huge tradition of, um, uh, of psychoanalysis uh, is that, um, uh, well, mm, uh, the problem with psychoanalysis and with the unconscious that starts from Voloshinov in his book Freudianism and then goes through Vygotsky's critique and then goes through Soviet psychology of Leontiev was that um, definitely uh, the unconscious is uh, uh, a necessary part of uh, consciousness, but there is no epistemic division between the unconscious and consciousness. These are not two material forces, but these are two contents, actually, two ideologies. So, um, um, uh, uh, what is the problem with the unconscious? It, it is stuck uh, in Freudian psychoanalysis to psyche. Uh, and psyche is uh, much more than no. Uh, uh, connected with the um, with the solipsist uh, self-analysis, self-observation. So it doesn't have enough and sufficient tools to produce the uh, common work. And, and, and what is important in consciousness? So consciousness is uh, um, re-established in this um, socialist. Um, framework not at all as a psychological category. So consciousness is totally devoid of any psychological connection with any phenomenolo phenomenological connections. Uh, and the main thing in consciousness, as Voloshinov um, puts it, is that it gives the opportunity to look at yourself from the point of view of the other. So uh, how Lacan treats the other, for instance? Uh, how David Butler treats the other. The other is this absent other, or the other is the alienated I. So <clears throat> always the other is somehow mirroring this super ego or the subject. And so even when in Lacan's case everything is internalized and ingressed into the unconscious, uh, then of course there is the sociality, there is a, a huge material in, in this expanded Lacanian unconscious to provide social analysis, but nevertheless um, this analysis it is stuck to the eye. So this um, separate other um, is not able to become the full-fledged sovereign subject. And consciousness, as, is, as it is taken uh, in Marxist terms, uh, and uh, we have it in Voloshinov, is this absolute standpoint of the other. I don't exist. So there is no ego. There is only the standpoint uh, of the other, and then consciousness becomes mm, uh, 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 the initial uh, uh, view of the other one. Because when uh, the subject is born to the world, uh, um, there is no ego. There are only other things. Everything is other. The culture is already um, produced, uh, the um, language is produced, material culture is produced. So what is consciousness? It's actually the reflection and some kind of remnants of what had been produced by others. So it's also uh, actually the um, repository of the non-self-being. So what is consciousness? It's, it's a much more Hegelian term than phenomenological term. Consciousness is some kind of um, proof that uh, most important thing in production is the other determined non-self being. So consciousness proves that the, the being is uh, grounded in the non-self being and this non-self element constructs consciousness. Uh, and uh, 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 there is another very important uh, description of how uh, Marxist interpretation of consciousness works in, in the piece by Merab Mamardashvili. If you heard such philosopher, uh, he worked in 60s, 70s, and he was disciple of Ilyenko. Um, and he has two seminal works, Analysis of Consciousness in Works by Marx, and another Converted Forms um, in, uh, in Marx. And he writes when he tries to uh, account for how Marx treats consciousness. Uh, so again, uh, this uh, is not a psychic, of, a psychic re uh, realm and domain, but polit-economic domain. 
Marx constructed his research so that already in the point of departure, he had to deal with the systems functioning and realized via consciousness. These were for him the social and economic systems. Hence, it became possible to consider consciousness as the function, as the attribute of social system, deducing the contents of consciousness and form from the intersections and differentiations in the system and not from the simple reflection of the object in the subject's perception. So it has nothing to do with perception, it's the uh, construction of uh, production. Thus consciousness itself functions as the objectified realia to which the individual is expanded. And as Mamardashvili writes, for Marx, it is not projection that is the product of consciousness, but consciousness is the reverse appropriation of that projection and objectification. And what is important here, it is realized completely independent of the individual and working in the social system. Um, so, um, this impossibility to say I is constructing this kind of, of consciousness. Uh, thus, uh, for Voloshinov in his Freudianism, uh, Freudianism too, uh, 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 it was um, uh, important to, uh, to, to claim this, uh, this new ideology of uh, consciousness and um, uh, to find the real which could exert the social function not on behalf of the I, but uh, taking the already uh, uh, existing and created material culture, not as the, re the repository of the other unconscious, but as the um, uh, produced, um, produced common good, common value, in a certain sense. And now I shift uh, to the most tricky part, which is uh, sexuality and libidinality. Uh, mm, uh, so, um, what is important here? Um, uh, definitely when we talk about uh, the castrated sexuality of the socialist life, everyone is asking, oh, oh, well, are you crazy? Uh, uh, well, it had even more sex than uh, other capitalist societies. <laughs> it's uh, it's definitely it might be so. I'm not a sociologist <laughs> to really analyze that. But again, I totally agree with Samo uh, because he has a wonderful uh, observation in his book about the drive. You're right. The drive has nothing to do with this natural initial um, um, realm, but it is produced as some kind of quasi physiological, uh, artificial. Uh, product and it has this uh, symbolic undercurrents nonetheless than other symbolic things. So, so, um, so, uh, so this element that which is considered to be in the very basis of uh, libidinal production is in fact also uh, symbolically grounded. Which means that if you don't have uh, certain ontic uh, conditions for the production of the drive, then it can be. Um, not necessarily eliminated, but it can start function in other way. So uh, then my analysis of sexuality is not starting from bodies, but it starts from how phantasm is conditioned. Uh, uh, and of course, um, uh, sexuality is not sex and simply genital intercourse, but it is language. It is a speculative uh, a value and speculative phenomenon. Uh, and the confirmation for this is even Foucauldian work where Foucault shows that sexuality uh, appears only with the bourgeois consciousness when it is juridically uh, either um, uh, prohibited or uh, um, just uh, taken as some kind of uh, surplus in enjoyment. Uh, um, it is not part of feudal context. Um, and uh, then what happens to the object which, which is not libidinal, which is not a commodity object? Um, uh, 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 and then you will understand why this object and the form of this object uh, is so important to talk about sexuality, is that it is 
constructed and produced in the in the in the frame of basic basic need. So um, in, in capitalist production, uh, the surplus and the economic surplus is intertwined with, with the libidinal and phantasmatic surplus. So what comes first uh, is not clear. Well, Marx believes that this phantasmatic surplus and fascination uh, of the fetish can be unwinded, but then uh, in later works we understand that this libidinal charm cannot be so easily unwinded. Uh, nevertheless, if you have the basic need economy, then you have a fantastic basic need form of the object. When the object is not um, uh, uh, revealing its uh, attractive parameters, but it, uh, it is revealing its nominal parameters, as if uh, the platonic need uh, could have been uh, realized in terms of like, the chair is the chairness of chair, the table is the tableness of table, the pen is the penness of pen, but not a specific pen, or not a pen of special company which is producing these pens and not other pens. And if you go through the material culture, uh, and if you have this basic need uh, objecthood, uh, then you understand that what happens in this object is that this division between uh, the utilitarian functional uh, element and uh, the phantasmatic element is completely minimized and then the object becomes a nomen, simply a nomen and this nominalization of the meta uh, when uh, the object uh, practically fits its own name and um, uh, word and, uh, and, and concept and meaning um, is very well described already in art, for instance, in Moscow conceptualism, which we are using exactly these bad socialist objects, um, absolutely unneeded, unattractive, and non-fascinating, uh, and calling them the bad thing, the bad object, Vish. And this bad object, uh, in certain sense, was a, um, a sublime object, because it was uh, a nominal object. So, so this is one of the outcomes of how it um, functions uh, in the material culture. But then you have the extension into the biopolitics of sexuality. And, and what happens with, with this um, biopolitics of sexuality? For instance, imagine that this uh, basic need object is the underwear. How to exist sexually within this basic need underwear? And that, there were many exhibitions in post Soviet context um, uh, uh, about uh, this issue, how, how to construct body in these conditions. But um, uh, I would uh, uh, um, uh, I would refer you to Andrei Platonov's um, pamphlet, which is called Antisexus. Um, it's a famous pamphlet um, uh, where Andrei Platonov is uh, making an irony about. Uh, how to devoid sexuality from the beaten parameters and turn it only to satisfaction of the urge. So that the um, uh, uh, sexuality um, is simply genital <coughs> innervation. And then you can prove that sexuality is not about genitality, but it's about this libidinal surplus. So then, uh, 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 even if you don't have a, a, genital context, you can have libidinal surplus and things can be sexual. Uh, and at the same time, you can have genital context and this genital context can be devoid of the libidinality and sexuality. And uh, yeah, so antisexus device is the device that aims to remove from, from life and communication, not sex but sexuality, libidinality, desire, drive. Uh, and what is obliterated in it is precisely the yearning, the libidinal, the surplus element, the elusive something. Uh, genital satisfaction, as against sexuality, does not necessarily reside in desire. It is implemented in an immediate biophysiological need. So what is this dystopia of Platonov? Is that in every factory or in every institution there will be, you know, this apparati uh, for uh, the... Um, um, urge discharge, urge dis discharge, and this would free Soviet citizens from this libidinal element, and they would be great friends, great lovers, uh, also uh, the production would increase 
So. <laughs> Don't tell them that. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, uh, um, then, uh, it, it, uh, so this is obsession, uh, like to tear away sexuality in this biophysical determination. But this biophysical determination is the obsession of Voloshinov as well, and of Vygotsky as well. When Vygotsky is writing the um, introduction to Beyond Pleasure Principle, uh, initially he's quite critical of Freud because of his pleasure principle, because pleasure principle is foreclosing the reality principle. But in this case, he interprets the Beyond Pleasure Principle uh, as the impact of pure bi biology, which is able to evade psyche. Well, you prove that it's not that, it's not so at all, and I agree with you, because the enjoyment principle and Thanatos death drive principle are interconnected, and these are not two separate things, but this is the interpretation of Vygotsky, because they want to extract this biophysical element, uh, material element, uh, from sexuality. Uh, and uh, the same uh, uh, thing <coughs> happens in uh, Voloshinov's work, who is uh, uh, criticizing Freud, uh, uh, exactly for this um, um, obsessive, um, not obsessive, exactly from detachment of the psychical from the somatic. Um, as he writes, in Freud's work on sexuality, both its social and physiological parameters are superseded by psyche and are thus deprived of physical, somatic, and hence materialist uh, parameters, which would enable them to be more directly dependent on social economic factors. So why biological parameters are advantages and primary? Because psyche is a stumbling block between sociality and access to the individual. And then uh, the reduction of sexuality to a biological dimension would enable it to be redirected to the sphere of, of genital, uh, which is actually antisexual, anti uh, and without the libidinal undercurrents, the uh, bond with the sociality would be smoother. Um, well, and... Uh, I think um, my last point would be that what happens in these uh, conditions to, um, to the language, uh, because uh, the linguistic part is also very important to, to Samo. Mm, uh, <coughs> but generally, well, uh, I will try to put it very simply. Generally, the language is an abstraction, right? So it's the mode of alienation, abstraction, um, uh, of uh, signification, and the some kind of detachment of the signifier from uh, the possibility to relate to reality. And it, it's a traumatic point how to relate the signifier to the reality. So there are two modes of uh, how to treat this um, uh, autonomy and uh, alienated mode of the signifier. One is Lacanian mode, uh, uh, and he's saying that, um, well, the subject is not able to surpass uh, this permanent alienated condition of discourse, and it's not impossible to surpass the alienated um, mm, uh, parameters of the signifier. The second uh, alternative is the Lozian Guattarian, which says that, yes, there is alienation in the signifier, but let's make this performative complement. Let's make schizophrenic um, performative play um, uh, and somehow try to go beyond the signifier and then get some kind of assignifying possibilities. And then alienation is treated so that you alienate alienation. So you to somehow exceed the already existing regulated alienation of capitalism, you are complementing it and adding to this capitalist alienation certain performative, even more uncanny and more intense forms of alienation to produce the creative and artistic subversion of it. Uh, uh, so the, the, uh, I, I'm moving very fast, sorry for that, uh, but I'm finishing uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, so what happens in, uh, in, in the Vygotskian um, 
linguistics, uh, with Voloshinov, with Ilyenkov, so all that uh, group that was um, working uh, with how to re-establish and reinstitute language in the socialist conditions, uh, also because it was the uh, repository of either conscious or unconscious phenomena. Mm, um, so what happens here uh, is that, yes, language deals with abstraction, language is uh, generalization, it is abstraction, but what stands behind the language is not instincts, affects, drives, or the unconscious, that what stands behind the language is not some kind of non-cultural, psychic, contingent categories, but this is totally crazy. What stands behind the language is even more ideal, more general picture, and this is the picture of exactly this non-self-being and non-self-reality of labor. And labor is, of course, ideal, as we know, because it's the, uh, uh, it's the activity of... Um, it's the uh, activity of... of um, uh, active, it's, the, it's part of the human activity. So, um, beyond uh, language is not the unconscious, it is sociality and collective labor, which is general simply because it is by definition ungraspable by individual mind, and it's diachronic in its historicist scale. And then language becomes simply an um, appli application. So language is not something that you have to fear, uh, but language has a, a, a very uh, applied um, uh, role, and as Alexei Leontiev writes in his Activity and Consciousness, uh, language is the vehicle of meaning, but language is not the demiurge of meaning. Concealed behind lingui linguistic meanings are socially evolved modes of action in the process of which people change and cognize objective real uh, reality. So the problem is not then the split between signifier and signified, the split between word and thing, but that objecthood itself is known. So again, what I told you when I talked about commodity, uh, that this, this capacity to, um, for the object to exist in general terms is before the language. Um, and uh, uh, then this becomes the motto for Vygotsky as well, because Vygotsky is saying that the word is ready only when the notion is ready. This is also quite crazy. So the notion precedes the, the word. And this is counter Jacobsonian statement, because Jacobsonian state, uh, Roman Jacobson's uh, philosophy of language was residing on the possibility of the contingent throw of autopoiesis of language. And he writes how the child is producing this autopoietic uh, capacity to, to produce uh, language. And then if language is totally attached initially and by definition to the notion, and the notion is in addition to this already objecthood, then uh, uh, this becomes um, <laughs> a big paradise. <laughs> So, um, um, and then return to this uh, crazy book by Voloshinov, which is Marxist and the philosophy of language, which is also saying the same thing. Word is not internal. That's why, this is the reason why he's not trusting psychoanalysis, because psychoanalysis is all the time internalizing speech, right? Uh, psychicizing speech. And, and he claims word is external, not internal, because there is nothing unexpressed in the world, in the word. Ideology is social, psyche individual, and hence psyche follows ideological sign, not the other way. Therefore, inner speech cannot solve the issue of the collective, of the social, of political, simply because it does not depart from the other. Again, this initial condition of the other. And I am ending um, um, uh, with this question, which is very un- um, unresearched question about this nominality of the material, which is my idea, but uh, it really needs more and more uh, evidences. So where it comes from? Uh, as you remember, I mentioned cleaning, and probably someone will be talking about cleaning. But um, um, for instance, Leontiev, when he was writing his book Activity and Consciousness, uh, and claiming that before the language comes um, the notion and 
the ideal element of material uh, life is already present. They were relying on their experiments with the deaf and blind children. And here, you have totally deviated creatures. They have no uh, capacity to hear, no capacity to see, moreover, no capacity to speak. So, then in this case, the project is not clinic, but pedagogy. And then what was the tool to organize that these children learn language? and acquire consciousness, what they acquire, consciousness or the unconscious, how they acquire it. So they were organizing the technique of how to create language in the situation when there is no eyesight, no perception, no capacity to see first the image of the object, but the learning was completely manual. So already on the level of Gegenstand, touching the object, the optical, conceptual, cognitive categories were formed. And that's why all of them were claiming that the material is already the speculative, cognitive, and um, connecting, uh, uh, connected with the uh, thing. So before this deaf and blind child produces the word, he or she already produces the uh, cognitive um, comprehending parameters of having this notion out of this very straightforward haptic materiality that he has through manual touch. Um, and then, well, Leontief has lots of theories about dioptrics and he refers to Diderot. Uh, I have no time for this. Uh, but uh, this was very important to claim and somehow to uh, pr um, assert that a Marxist idea was the same, that already on the level of the materiality, or le already on the le level of uh, labor, already on the level when this deaf and blind child is learning how to use the spoon, or how to touch the form of an art piece or sculpture and understand this sculpture, because it's not simply about the touch and the body, but it, it is about, by means of the hand, constructing the nomen, the meaning. So already on this level, you can get Bildung. Um, I would end up here, and then we could discuss it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, first of all, thank you very much, Katie, for uh, inviting me in this uh, uh, exchange and to Alberto for hosting the, uh, uh, the event in the framework of the center. I um, will stick to an uh, unwritten arrangement that Katie already uh, also gave away. Uh, um, um, so. Uh, I will talk about the, the question of alienation, and, uh, basically about something that that, that is uh, one of my uh, uh, little private obsessions, uh, that, that professional expression, uh, um, an attempt to sort of de-dramatize de the notion of, of alienation and try to kind of uh, point or provide also an optimistic reading, uh, or optimistic reading of, uh, of it, even though I'm, I'm aware that the optimistic and the pessimistic or the dram dramatic and the comic aspect of alienation are interrelated. Um, so basically I will, uh, I will talk about the heart for most of, it, uh, most of the, uh, the time in the second, talk, uh, half, second half of my talk um, in order to point uh, in which sense uh, point out a uh, very basic uh, thing uh, how uh, Marx and Freud are actually repeating Descartes uh, in reverse, uh, so to speak. So basically there will be a very uh, commonly known, I, I assume, the Kenyan points floating around, but I thought that I would just recall, uh, recall them. So, uh, for framing the debate on alienation and also to kind of uh, 
make us all remember why alienation is so crucial for uh, psychoanalysis, for critique of political economy, and for materialist orientation of thinking. Um, so uh, I will do a return to the current um, in order to reflect on Lacan's point that uh, the current's deduction of cogito is the condition of the Freudian subject of the unconscious. And if the <clears throat> proletarian and the subject of the unconscious are closely related, as Lacan sometimes openly argued and sometimes implicitly that, uh, indicated, then Marx and Freud are ultimately engaged with the repressed truth of cogito and, as I said, repeat the Cartan verse. Descartes is thus here as, a, as an epistemological condition of the Freudian, Marxian, materialist theory of the subject. Um, I will go through what is fundamental to psychoanalysis and particularly for Lacan, the attempt to elaborate a materialist theory of language. There is leave open whether this theory is scientific, philosophical, or, or something third. In any case, it is a strict doctrine in, in, in Lacan's teaching. A materialist theory of language, which comes in pair, or is simply indistinguishable from a materialist theory of the subject. Lacan provided formalized writing for this nexus, the bar A and the bar S, which respectively uh, designate the incompleteness of the field of language and the incompleteness of the subject. And here I can already react in a way to, to, to what Kitty was also addressing. Uh, talking about incompleteness is of course misleading here because it, it leads one to believe that something is lacking and that filling this lack will make the subject or language complete. This is neither Freud's nor Lacan's point. Uh, lack is not correlated to a positively <coughs> existing object which would fill in the lack, but to a surplus which cannot be mapped onto the lack and vice versa. Uh, Freud called this castration. Uh, uh, we know that the same issue is at stake in Marx when he talks about the drive of enrichment or the drive of self-valorization. Surplus value does not fill in the gap that defines the drive and guarantees its satisfaction. On the contrary, it stimulates the drive and is the cause of its per perpetual dissatisfaction. So if you read the... I mean, it's, it's, it's no coincidence that in all crucial passages of capital, Marx speaks of uh, three. Same word as in Freud, uh, I would argue it's the same concept. But you don't, have to, you, don't have, you don't have to take my word. Um, but to, to return to the question of incompleteness, here also the notorious question of alienation finds, finds its proper place. And so far as alienation stands for a process which marks the subject as well as the other, Lacan's dictum, the other does not exist, can be associated precisely with the question of uh, the alienation of the other, the big other language, symbolical. This placement of the problem, however, should be supplemented with a historical framing, uh, a history of alienation, or perhaps better, a, hi a history of philosophical confrontations of, uh, 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 of alienation, which is indeed the history of modern philosophy, reaching back to good old Descartes. Um, and in this history, Marx evidently assumes a central place. In his thesis on Feuerbach, one can read how Marx addresses the question of decentralization of the subject, which is one of the synonyms for, for alienation. What are the features of a materialist conception of man, or rather, of the subject? First, his, uh, his formulation of what he calls, quote, the chief defect of all uh, hitherto existing materialism. And this de defect lies, according to Marx, uh, um, in the fact that, quote, the thing reality, sensuousness, is conceived only in the form of the object or contemplation, but not the sensuous human activity practi practice, not subjectively, unquote. You know, this uh, 
famous lines. In other words, materialism before Marx makes the mis mistake of excluding the subject from the picture, thus leaving the terrain for thinking human activity to idealism whose defect in turn consists in the fact that, as Marx writes, it, quote, does not know real sensuous activity as such, unquote. So materialism before Marx knows sensuous activity but without a subject, to reformulate it. Uh, an example of this would be mechanicism or, or Lametri's uh, man-machine, whereas idealism knows the subject but without, sen without sensuous activity. Here, activity pertains <coughs> to an immaterial substance which is not lost, precisely not alienated, in the body. So, again, non-sensuous activity. And one could add at this point that Hegel does not fit this picture, since his whole attempt is to think substance as subject, and as becoming another keyword for alienated being. Um, Feuerbach, from whom Marx is delimiting himself, thus resolves the idealist or religious essence, the activity of abstractions, into human essence, thus creating the appearance that, the, that he points the way toward real sensuous activity and to the real subjectivity. But this is not the case for, quote Marx, the human essence is no abstraction inherent in each single individual, unquote. Behind the appearance of materialism, the move of reducing divine essence to human essence, Marx overlooks that this, this essence is, quote, Marx again, in its reality, the ensemble of social relations, unquote. Marx, man is relational being. His essence is outside, his relation is alienation. And because Feuerbach does not see this, he ends up in idealism, where the question is to reverse alienation. If man, is an alienate, if man is alienated in God, then the inverse operation will bring man, man back to himself. For Feuerbach, alienation is thus a symmetrical, reflexive operation. And this is precisely not the case for Marx. For him, relations between men, social relations, are traversed by non-relationality, inauticity, distortion, which cannot be brought back to some presumable authenticity, and he, said, he names this in different ways. Mystification, class struggle, fetishism, ideology, and so on and so forth. In a way, Freud reproduces the Feuerbachian move, in a way. One merely needs to consult his developments in, uh, in this text on religion, the future of an illusion, and uh, in the concluding lecture on Weltanschauung, on worldviews, from his new introductory lectures on psychoanalysis. There Freud famously compares God with the figure of the Father, providing an anthropological materialist interpretation of religious abstractions. So, we are helpless, we want a strong father, oops, we don't get it because every father is a, uh, is a failure, oh, let's project things to God, the ideal father. So behind God is the idea of the ideal father. Uh, an abstraction which, however, has consequences, indifference to the Feuerbachian idealities. Whenever Freud uses the word illusion, we should not take it easily. So, it, it, in a way, he reproduces the Feuerbachian movement with this projection, but the illusion is real uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Freud. Marx break with Feuerbach a break that I just have described as epistemological, <clears throat> has in its core a theory of the subject understood as an effect of the ensemble of social relations. Thus not the ground, hypocanon, which would precede the ensemble in question. All this is well known, but it should be remembered that if Marx here indeed plays out one materialism against the other, then the problematic of alienation necessarily play, plays a key role in the determination of true materialism against the false one. In Feuerbach, human essence precedes alienation and is externalized, the topological meaning of alienation. In the second step, 
Here, alienation is secondary, something that is constituted. But what constitutes alienation is the question. It is usually said that the young Marx subscribed to this view and that the thesis on Farbach aimed to set things straight. There is no human essence preceding alienation, but alienation is primary, constitutive for the subject. The subject understood as an effect of the ensemble of social relations is a relational being outside itself. Again, externalization, which is a key Hegelian term for alienation and framework. In passing, I can add that this operation of externalization is also crucial for what Marx and Capital calls Verwandlung, metamorphosis. For instance, of money into commodities, of surplus value into capital, of labor force into surplus labor, etc. In any case, externalization is crucial for thinking the subject according to Marx and for elaborating the materialist theory of the subject. This externalization is also characteristic for the Freudian notion of the unconscious, which comes in as a surprising complement of Marx's thesis on Feuerbach. But it was only Lacan that linked this with the question of materialist theory of language. For instance, most, most explicitly in his responses to the Ecole Normale Superior philosophy students, where we read the following a bit longer passage. So sorry for this long quote now. Only my theory of language as a structure of the unconscious can be said to be implied by Marxism if, that is, you are not more demanding than the material implication with which our most recent logic is satisfied. That is, that my theory of language is true, whatever be the adequacy of Marxism, and that it, that it is needed by it, whatever be the defect that it leaves Marxism with. So much for the theory of language implied logically by Marxism. As for the one it has implied historically, I have barely but to offer you, given the modest limits of my information as to what goes on beyond a certain doctrinal curtain, 30 pages by Stalin that put an end to the frolics of Marism, from the name of the philologist Mar, who considered language to be a superstructure statements of rudimentary common sense concerning language and specifically concerning the point that it is not a superstructure whereby the Marxist on the subject of language situates himself far above the logical positivist. The least you can accord me concerning my theory of language is, should it interest you, that it is materialist. The signifier is matter transcending itself in language. So unquote. So the connection between Marxism and psychoanalysis, or between Marx and Freud, is less historical than it is logical. Lacan speaks of material implication, thus pointing out the logical rootedness of materialism, which to recall is always true, except in the case when the antecedence is true and the consequence is false. No false theory can follow from a true theory, so if Marx's theory is considered true, then Freud's theory is necessarily true. <coughs> the inverse, and this might be provoking for Marxists, does not hold. If Marx is false, Freud can still be true. <laughs> this logical implication, this logical materialist alliance, nevertheless did not prevent a history of misunderstandings and mutual suspicion. Joan Kopje commented the expert from Lacan in the following manner, and I apologize again for a long quote. But she really puts it in the best possible manner. Uh, as Lacan reminds us in his responses to students of, in philosophy, the materialist position was fixed in 1928 by Nicholas Yakolovich Mar, who concluded that language was a part of the superstructure. That is, it was a direct reflection of class struggle of the social determinations of the base. Rather than a national language then, there were thought to be class languages, just as in Lysenko account there were, thought, uh, there were thought to be class sciences. 22 years later, the solution was amended by Stalin to point the matter of uh, factly for counterproof to the continuity of the Russian language despite the social changes brought about by the revolution. Having removed language from the superstructure, 
Stalin was prohibited, nevertheless, from assigning it to the base, since he believed that language was in itself incapable of producing anything. Not Lacan's point. Uh, defining as neither superstructure nor base the only available alternatives in this schema, language was emptied of all attributes and became, in theory, a purely transparent instrument of communication. A return to Aristotle. Against these problematic stances, Lacan argues, and he is not alone in this, that language has its own level of determinacy, that it is itself productive of effects." Unquote. So this ambitious, um, ambiguous placement of language in an intermediate zone, neither base nor superstructure, but something that is pre-basic and pre-superstructural, neither sensuous nor suprasensuous, is crucial for situating the encounter of Marx and Freud. L language is placed here in an ontological gray zone, the same gray zone in which Marx situated the system of exchange, or the, the economic, the symbolic order that sustains uh, 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 economic relations. Because it is localized in this gray zone, language can be marked by a timeless problematic, precisely alienation, which is never the, nevertheless subject to change. So it's at the same time historical. Why? If language would be a phenomenon of base, it would be unchangeable. If it would be part of the superstructure, changing it would not cause any major issue. And this was also Stalin's dilemma. To put it in Lacanese, in Soviet Russia, in communism, language was still following the logic of the master's discourse, uh, which is in itself already a problem. But the status of language is paradoxical. It's an ontological scandal. It does not exist, strictly speaking. Again, Lacan's haiku, the other does not exist. Yet it has material consequences. First and foremost, the body it inhabits, the speaking body. In his writing on drives and their vicissitudes, Freud addresses a similar problem, the ontological status of the drive which he frames in the following manner, quote, if now we apply ourselves to considering mental life from a biological point of view, a drive appears to us as a concept of the frontier between the mental and the somatic, as a psychical representative of the simile origi originating from within the organism and reaching the mind, as a measure of the demand made upon the, uh, uh, made upon the mind for work in consequence of its connection with the body." Unquote. So what is the drive? It is a positive force independent from its psychic... Uh, uh, psych is it a positive force independent from its psychic representative or is it rather the force of this representative itself? This is where one materialism, the biological one, is pitted against the other, the structural one. In his reading on the unconscious, in his writing on the unconscious, Freud states, quote, the drive can never become an object of consciousness, only the idea that represents the drive can. Even in the unconscious, moreover, a drive cannot be represented otherwise than, <laughs> than by an idea. When we nevertheless speak of an unconscious drive impulse or of a repressed drive impulse, we can only mean a drive impulse the ideational representative of which is unconscious." Unquote. So the uncon no biology in the unconscious. Or if there is a biology, it's soaked with, uh, with, uh, uh, with culture. Of course, a drive cannot become the object of consciousness because the drive does not exist. What exists is the drive force. The dynamic caused by the ideational representative or as Lacan would put it, by the signifier, by language, in the, in, in the living body. This problematic juncture of the mental and the somatic stands at the very core of Freud's inquiries. The drive and the unconscious are merely two privileged names for the material consequences of the mental, the linguistic, in the body. What is at stake here is, as Jean-Claude Menard fittingly put it, a parasitism of the infinite on the finite. The drive 
is described by Freud as constant force. Hence, as a force acting without interruption. In Marx's analysis of the double character of commodity, the same problematic juncture so of, uh, of, of the bodily and of the symbolic stands at the center. In the economic sphere, the fusion of use value and exchange value points towards the same drive parasitism of the infinite on the finite. Concretely, the infinite demand of surplus value on the finite laboring body. That's why labor is in the center of, in the center of Marx's interests. Uh, because they're, they're, they're the, what, what's very fittingly uh, 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 named Verausgabung in German. Can be, can be demonstrated for us in, in the sense of economic expenditure and physiological exhaustion. So the, the body is sucked dry uh, of surplus. Uh, capital as drive of self-valorization too imposes its demand for work on the body, a demand for surplus labor for which Marx reminds us or shows us that it's virtually endless and encounters its sole limit in the natural limit of the working day or in the, in the, in the physiological limits of the, of the body folding itself together. Uh, now, a materialist theory of language, to jump back to Lacan's interest, which goes hand in hand with the materialist theory of the subject, does not merely imply what Lacan calls matter transcending itself in language, but also language producing real consequences in the living body, or to inverse Lacan's formula, abstraction descending or getting inscribed in the body. Here, going against the Aristotelianism of Stalin's intervention in the Soviet linguistic debates, the Aristotelianism consists in the thesis according to which language is a means of communication and that there is something like self-regulation and equilibrium in language. Lacan counteracts this view, which is anything but materialist, his double thesis on the autonomy and the causality of the signifier brings this protest against Stalinist Aristotelianism to the point. That's why also he says historically you can see that the material implication is illustrated by if Marxism is false, psychoanalysis is true. Uh, no. Stalin is false, Lacan is true. Uh, language is an organized disequilibrium in the living body. So the self-transcendence of matter must be necessarily complemented with the immanence of abstraction to the body and with all the, with all the dysfunctions that, is, that it produces. In his Marxist philosophy of language, Jean-Jacques Le Cercle pointed out on the case of Noam Chomsky, which pleases me uh, immensely, <laughs> that there is an affinity between modern linguistics and liberalism. <laughs> and I'd say that just as for economic liberalism, the market is a self-regulating entity which exists and functions independently from human agencies, and homo economicus, a subject supposed to uh, know how to act in accordance with the free market while possessing positive knowledge of its mechanisms for linguistic liberalism, and I will also put the entire analytic philosophy in this basket, self-regulating language comes in pair with an idealized conscious subject of communication. In other words, for both language and the subject exist, uh, 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 for, for both uh, economic and linguistic liberalism, Language and the subject exist in a strong, substantial sense. What Le Cercle describes as a Marxist and materialist uh, philosophy of language in turn follows the following perspectives, and I'll just line them up. Language is a form of praxis, a historical phenomenon, a social phenomenon, a material phenomenon, a political phenomenon, a place one should rather say space of subjectivation through interpolation. This is where Lacanian would say interpolation is not, is not, hard, uh, is not going far enough. Suture would be Lacan's uh, uh, um, proposal. 
But all these features presuppose that language is alienation. Alienation in, in the primary sense that Hegel gives to the word for the oiseron, externalization, a process which is constitutive of the difference between the inner and the outer. It is at this point that one should, I think, refer to the history of alienation and to see how basically in the history of uh, modern philosophy the <coughs> problematic progressively came to the, to the foreground. And before I continue uh, babbling on that, how much time do I still have? Uh, oh, okay. But I can, I can say some, some parts of this. So the discovery of alienation, the first crucial philosophical encounter of alienation is constitutive for the thinking subject and as a fundamental concept of a materialist theory of the subject coincides historically and logically with Descartes' introduction of the modern notion of the subject in the first place. That was Lacan's also implicit thesis that I'm trying to explicate here. Descartes founded philosophy on the modern scientific revolution and as an outcome resolving the wide-reaching crisis this revolution triggered in the systems of thought, in the pre-modern met metaphysics. It was only a matter of time before these consequences would shake the Aristotelian foundations of the theory of the subject, his metaphysical psychology anchored in the hypothesis of the soul. Even if Descartes did not entirely abolish the vocabulary that was passed on by the Aristotelian tradition, the introduction of Cogito marked an irreversible point that opened up the horizon in which the subsequent conceptualization of alienation was made possible. Descartes' philosophical gesture is subjective alienation in action, its most genuine exemplification. We merely need to consider his transformation of Montaigne's skepticism into a positive method of systematic doubt in order to notice that we are dealing with a specific mobilization of alienation in the field of modern science, or more generally, in the modern mode of knowledge production. Lacan most openly embraced the thesis that alienation became a philosophical question only with Descartes, that philosophical and scientific modernity and capitalist uh, is inaugurated in and through subjective alienation. In, distinct, in distinction from pre-modern science, which was, according to Plato and Aristotle, driven by totaumatzein, wonder, astonishment. Lacan repeatedly uh, showed how the invention of Cogito, Descartes' reduction of all human existence and its qualities to the pure I think, historically, philosophically, and epistemologically conditions the Freudian discovery of the unconscious and makes the subject of the unconscious another version of thought without qualities, just like the Cartesian Cogito, notably without the quality of consciousness, thinkable in the first place. And this is, of course, a, from Lacan's part, a very strange, one could even say alienating thesis, since nothing could be more foreign to the Freudian subject than the Cartesian Cogito, this subject reduced to the pure identity of thought with itself, I think, and to the apparent identity or, or coinciding of thinking with being. I think, therefore, I am. The catch and the crack, for that matter, the crack on the surface of consciousness that inaugurates the royal road to alienation and negativity surely resides in the worm of doubt which splits the subject and directs the movement of its thoughts. But it also resides in the structure of the most famous inference uh, in the history of philosophy next to Aristotle's syllogism on the immortality of all men. The problematic therefore, er ergo, which deduces being from thinking, and which can be read as a joint that seems to establish continuity and at the same time indicates a minimal rupture or displacement between thinking and being, as well as within thinking and being. So if for Parmenides thinking and being was the same, 
in the cart they follow with a minimal with a minimal displacement. Uh, therefore, the Cartesian, therefore the ergo, is a double index, a link and a break, a continuity and a discontinuity. It binds only in order to expose a permanently resolute difference, a fissure in the subject's thinking and being. Due to this ambiguity of the cogito, Cartesianism could eventually ground both the idealist theories of the subject, consciousness, individualism, identity, and the materialist theories of the subject, unconscious divisional, divisionalism, uh, indifference to individual, individualism, and non-identity, so modern idealism and materialism. Unknowingly, Descartes therefore contained the first recognition of the spatial temporal displacement that marks the subject. But his deduction of cogito and the reduction of thought to consciousness amounts to a centralized geometry of the subject, which erroneous, erroneously postulates the primacy of relata before relation, the primacy of thinking and being before their problematic relation of identity and displacement, continuity and discontinuity, homotopy and heterotopy. In addition, privileging identity over non-identity removes the temporal dynamic from the process that constitutes the subject. History. There is no history on the level of the Cartesian subject. The best geometric representation of such a presumably non-alienated subject remains the Cartesian coordinate system in which the space of res extensa emanates from the central point without extension. In contrast to this Cartesian geometrization of the space of thinking, the affirmation of alienation as constitutive for the subject implies a topological model that Lacan someone that enigmatically called the asphere of non-all. Uh, so one of his uh, typical uh, uh, play on words. But what's crucial here is the asphere, the non-sphere, the negation of the sphere, the negation of this idealized, closed, centralized shape. So the space of thinking and hence the structure of the subject are not closed and centralized, which would be the case if one were to take the sphere as the geometrical model. They are also not simply infinite. They are negation of finitude, so asphere or non-sphere again, which exposes their constitutive incompleteness, non-all character. So in this way, not only spatial disclosure, but also the historical process is introduced as a key component of the structure in question. So from a Lacanian perspective, the Cartesian Cogito does not designate a being, but a process of becoming. The subject here no longer appears as an invariable and stable extra-historic or trans-historic center but rather an unstable metonymic negativity which undergoes historical transformations and is thus permanently embedded in an open and conflictual process of becoming. This is why clinics in, in, uh, in Freud, if Freud is a Cartesian, as Lacan argues, uh, is precisely the illustration of, of, of this. The subject on the couch is his or her own conflictual history. And this is where thinkers like Hegel, Marx, and Freud progressively correct Cartesianism with their dialectical and materialist term. I'm not going to spell it out here. This uh, uh, is then uh, in the book that I, I was told before this talk I should, uh, I, I should do some commercials on it. Alberto was also mentioned. Um, so, but I would recall from this history the fact that in his variations on Cogito, Lacan made a great deal of Descartes' therefore, proposing ever new interpretations and transcriptions of Descartes' inference, which all target the inscription and constitution of the subject on two heterogeneous but nevertheless mutually linked places and registers, enunciation enunciated, thought being, consciousness unconscious, truth knowledge, etc. <coughs> The idea of the split which traverses thought and sustains its subject 
constituting its existence on a line that both associates and divides, making the subject in the same move identical and non-identical to itself. Descartes missed the opportunity to philosophically grasp the split in question. That's also one of Lacan's points. Alienation was encountered and overlooked as soon as he accomplished the move from methodological doubt to scientific certainty and from cogito understood as enunciation without substance and thought without qualities to res cogitans, conceived as immaterial substance and thought with qualities, above all with the quality of consciousness. And subsequent philosophies forgot, if I may say so, the encounter with alienation as the birth power of the first modern theory of the subject, and privileged the examination of the laws of conscious thought. The main feature of the subject, its constitutive instability and its futile, metonymic, historical, and thus alienated character were removed from the picture. To return again at this point to Descartes' founding gesture, Despite all its tendency to stabilize thought and subjectivity, the Cartesian example succeeded in demonstrating that cogito is no metaphysical substance, but a specific action which depends entirely on the signifier, a signifier in action, whose ontological consequences remain ambiguous. Cogito is caught in an ontological gray zone between not yet being and no longer non-being. Idealistic decision with respect to those consequences led to the familiar substantialization of thought and the abolition of continuous discontinuity or discontinuous continuity, however we want to have it, between the inside and the outside. Their subsequent materialist determination continued to condition a threefold decentralization of thinking, of language, and of history. Let's say here again, Hegel, Marx, and Freud, um, instead of Nietzsche. Uh, uh, so Marx and Freud are hyper-Cartesians in the sense that they overcome the nor normalization of Descartes' founding gesture by radicalizing its groundbreaking point of departure and inversing the idealist stabilization of the cogito which transformed its metonymic being into the metaphor of the thinking substance and thereby regressed into the framework of what I would provisorically call metaphorical ontology. So ontology obsessed with the question of the highest being. Uh, the main critical gesture of Marx and Freud resides in the move from who to where, from the thinking and laboring substance to the place of thought and labor. At the center of this critical endeavor is, once again, the desubstantialization of thought, a related yet more radical attempt at the Cartesian reduction of all thought procedures to the apparently empty I think, withdrawn from the noise of the world. The Cartesian move, radical as it may seem, nevertheless failed to remove one crucial quality of thought, which was in turn destabilized by skepticism, consciousness, of which Descartes made the anchoring point of the subject's certitude. I have here a passage where Lacan comments on, uh, on skepticism that I will skip so I can get at least to part of the, of, of the point that I want to make. But the point of this quote is that Descartes' method merely imitates skepticism. Uh, and this is confirmed from the viewpoint of the results pro provided by what Descartes calls provisory morality and the meditation on cogito in his meditation. So the Cartesian doubt is undoubtedly anchored in what Lacan calls aphanesis, fading, in which we can observe the emergence of a subject whose being is reduced to fading, neither present nor absent, caught in the gray zone of existence and inexistence, a subject who is neither, no longer non-being and not yet Dasein existence being there, but rather is a thought and Dasein, a being there and away, in reference to Freud's example of his grandchild thought da, uh, thought da uh, game. So my being is thought and Dasein. 
um, <laughs> the subject's being contains a perpetual dynamic which takes the form of exchanging appearance and disappearance. However, Descartes wrote to science, paved by his desire for epistemic certainty and ontological stability, seems to sacrifice the, cru the crucial aspect of skepticism and thereby of the aphanesis of thinking and being. Not simply the refusal of all knowledge and the regression into some textbook example of sophistic relativism, but rather the insistence on non-relation and the incompatibility of truth and knowledge, on the conflictual character of truth. The impossibility of overcoming the conflictuality of truth by reducing it to accumulated knowledge endowed with certainty, where truth appears in the guise of facticity and relationality. Moreover, if there is something heroic in the position of skepticism, as Lacan puts it in the quote that I didn't quote, it concerns its persistence in the situation in which the subject of thought assumes the impossible position that Lacan describes as separation. Separation does not stand uh, uh, for an abolition or overcoming of alienation, but for its radicalization, which reveals precisely the inexistence of the other. For instance, the inexistence of Descartes' benevolent and truth-loving God, and exposes the groundlessness of the subject's thinking and being. The skeptic recognizes in the subject's fading, <coughs> instability, incompleteness, uncertainty, the constitutive feature of subjectivity, which at the same time exposes the incompleteness of the other. And for this precise reason, as I stated initially, Lacan correlates the barred subject with the barred other. In this respect, radical skepticism points in, in a direction that seems to lead away from Descartes. In the skeptic separation from every phantasmatic ground projected in the other, the fading of the subject intensifies to the extent that it becomes the sign of inexistence, negativity, and incompleteness of the other, not of the subject, of the other. The skeptic cogito would thus infer, I doubt, therefore I fade. And moreover, I doubt, therefore the other does not exist. Thereby exposing the continuum between alienation of the subject and alienation of the other. In Descartes, on the contrary, the fading of the subject is seemingly overcome by an attempt to demonstrate the nexus of the ontological existence of the subject and the epistemological certitude of knowledge which are in turn taken as signs of the other's existence. I'm imperfect, so this must be a sign of a perfect being, uh, which is a little bit <laughs> difficult, like, hard to try. On the other way around, or the other way around, Descartes' foundation of the subject uncertainty, the certainty of knowledge, and the stable relation between knowledge and truth are possible only under the assumption of a benevolent other, a truth-loving God, who does not play tricks on us. And it is no coincidence that Lacan described this Cartesian God with the term the subject supposed to know, a meta-subject. The subject of knowledge desired by the alienated subject of doubt, concretely Descartes himself. Um, so, I think uh, this is going way too... Wait, wait, wait. So I just skip to the to the to the last uh, to the last page, so we get to an end. Sorry about this. Um, psychoanalysis may not have succeeded in reinventing pre-modern skepticism or this sort of heroic, radicalized skepticism that Lacan uh, proposes or contrasts to, to to Descartes, but it is it did propose a double affirmation of the skeptic anchoring of thought in what Lacan calls the living moment of the aphanesis of the subject, and of the Cartesian rupture with the pre-modern theory of the subject, the Aristotelian metaphysical soul. For its way of proceeding is from I think to I desire. In Descartes' case, I desire to be, or I desire to know. Lacan also remarks in this unquoted passage, desidero is the Freudian cogito, so desiring is the Freudian thought, desire is the Freudian thought. Another possible psychoanalytic formulation of the cogito would thus be, I desire, therefore I fade. Thus proposing an inversion of Descartes' ontological thesis. 
the zidero exposes the metonymy of the subject's being rather than its fixity and stability. The subject of desire cannot but remain caught in the movement of presence and absence, lack and surplus, which are said cannot be mapped onto each other and stabilized. This is also the critical point of Freud's imperative, where I was there, where it was there I shall become. So the subject never really is. It remains torn between a being that was and a being that will be, between no longer being and not yet being. The Freudian subject is a process of becoming from which the restlessness of the negative is impossible to eliminate. Only once it is deduced as a subject of certitude, <coughs> the Cartesian cogito is anchored in an apparently ahistorical present, while the Freudian desidero, and one could also say uh, the Marxian lavoro, work, working, remains split between past and future, which come together in a conflicted labor in the present. And the centrality of labor in Freud's theory of the unconscious leaves no doubt that the unconscious cogito is internally redoubled on desidero and lavoro. The problematic of labor enters the picture in its double guise as the ongoing labor of the unconscious which sustains the established psychopathological complex that consumes the subject, so that would be the part of Wo Eswa, and the labor of analysis which strives to bring about a future change in the analysant precisely by working on his or her history and the stretching of its consequences into the present. That would be the Zolich part. Changing the past is the main condition for inventing the future. And this, I think, would be also uh, the point where, where I would situate the, the encounter of Marxism and psychoanalysis and, uh, and uh, material implication where truth follows from, from, from truth and not false from false or not false, I mean true from false, whatever. Uh, so thanks, sorry, I was a little bit... Uh, too long. So I think I'll um, maybe uh, start by um, assuming my function as uh, chair, host, uh, uh, moderator, and so on, and maybe pose a couple of questions to to bring your to, to animate to bring your papers uh, together, and actually just to, in a sense, to to reframe uh, the original um, ab abstract for the session in light of what you in what in light of what you've said. And uh, and I guess there you know there are questions you know regarding what exactly does happen to um, contemporary debates, but let's say contemporary debates in that long post-68 wave about the relationship between psychoanalysis and Marxism or psychoanalysis and, and, and capitalism as a object of, of Marxist mm -hmm. theory when uh, we, we think of them in light of the you know, Soviet difference for want, of a, for want of a better term. And I, I suppose um, the, uh, um, the first question, uh, which, is, which is perhaps um, more uh, a question for Ketty, is about whether um, whether these are uh, problems that could be usefully approached by returning um, to a category that I guess is central not so much to the Marxist theory of capitalism but to the Marxist theory of communism. This is also a way of maybe getting you to elucidate more, which I found very interesting but I didn't quite get my head around the, the socialism communism distinction. But, but the, the question is in a sense whether there isn't, um, to put it perhaps somewhat facetiously, like a, like a psychic or psychoanalytic uh, equivalent of, of something like uh, you know, the new economic policy, so to speak. So you, know, you have a situation in which basically 
you know, in order to um, reproduce itself as a revolutionary process, Soviet Union, you know, in the in the early twenties, is 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 finds it necessary to inoculate itself or with a uh, you know with, uh, with without market, you know, after you after one has abandoned whether fully or, or partially or temporarily the idea of war communism as the possibility of a kind of more positively catastrophic, etc. Transi transition. And I think it's an interesting issue because, you know, you're partly bringing up this issue of different forms of commodity, different forms of the body, and so on and so forth. And there is, at least within the domain of um, historical studies of the Soviet Union, for instance, the whole study of the I'm thinking of a very interesting book by Christina Kier called Imagine No, no Possessions, just for instance. This book on yeah, so this whole question, you know, what, what, does, what happens when, you know, the object is no longer a commodity in mm. the capitalist sense, even though mm. there are kind of quasi-markets, but the object is rethought by Rochenko, Mekos, the other, you know, the object as comrade, the, a, a different relation to, sure. to, to the object. And so in that sense, it seems that one, I wonder whether one could think in a more psychoanalytically informed vein about this. About uh, communism. Well, about the issue of transition, about what does it mean, mm -hmm. rather than thinking in, in, in this perhaps uh, uh, too easily dichotomous way about, okay, well, here's psychoanalysis in capitalism, what happens course, with psychoanalysis yeah. in non-capitalism mm -hmm. or in socialism, etc. perhaps a more, Interesting question, which is of course also the question of you know Lenin's debates with Clara Zetkin about you know the the place of debates about sexuality and gender, etc., the revolution, etc. So um, uh, in, in, in this weird uh, auto interview about about uh, communism, Althusser has this formulation about transition. Where he says you know the, the formal subsumption of capitalism under communism, and, and I was wondering, I guess, if there is a psychoanalytic version uh, uh, of that. And I suppose my question, which is linked, and, and perhaps more um, more to Samo, would be to, uh, I mean, I guess if one, if, if one uh, uh, frames debates about psychoanalysis and ideology in light of what uh, uh, the, the, the material that Ketty presented, and also these texts by you know, Voloshino and Vygotsky mm -hmm. and others, it, it does seem that then, uh, you know, I suppose one could argue that there are theories, Marxist theories of ideology, that would perhaps be transposed into a Soviet or indeed a state socialist or a distributed economy scenario in a way that doesn't seem to trouble them too much. Uh, and ones that aren't. And they, that seems an issue that has to do with the question of of fetishism in particular. So, in many ways, it seems to me that you can take at least certain variants of Althusser's theory of ideology and transpose them to non-capitalist context in a not particularly difficult mm -hmm. way, in part because the question of fetishism is either denied or extremely marginal mm -hmm. to that to that yeah. phenomenon. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I'm not sure uh, uh, that in the different relationships to body, commodity, mm -hmm. etc. that you were talking about, at least certainly in the twenties, would make a, 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 a critical theoretical or a Frankfurt School or a, you know, a, a theory, a, a, a um, fetish theory of ideology mm -hmm. operative in the same manner. And I guess that then also goes to the issue of, um, you know, of, of alienation in the sense that, you know, what, what are the what are the points, you know, given your, your account, what are the points within a Lacanian problematization of the theory of alienation that are, that require further theorizing a logic of capital, or are there points where, in a sense, the logic of fantasy and the logic of capital come apart, and would something like thinking through those uh, uh, Soviet transformations and experiences be like a, a kind of test in mm -hmm. the sense of, it's not to say, well, this is an ahistorical theory of alienation, but perhaps it's a theory of alienation whose historicity does not force it to, to, to be operative in a capitalist context and not be operative in a Soviet one. I don't know if that sense. But those were just some, maybe some ways of posing the question. Maybe you can come back to that yeah. and then we can take some more. If I remember.
according to the question was how to how, how to um, use or yeah how to address uh, non-capitalist uh, socioeconomic frameworks with alienation. Mm -hmm. that yeah, in, in, in some sense, I mean. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, it's in, in, in a way, it's... I mean, in the sense of, you know, what happens, for instance, to statements like uh, the proletariat is a subject of the unconscious when class struggle is declared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that kind of... Yeah, yeah, no, but I mean, it's, it's, it's also very clear that, uh, that uh, um, because they do not start from the assumption of, a, of an ahistorical subjectivity, Marx and Freud cannot but stick to, to what, is, uh, what is in the given predicament, a historical form of subjectivity and a historical form of alienation. That's why, of course, this uh, um, homolog homologization that uh, Lacan make, um, I mean, indicates between the subject of the unconscious and the proletarian, and more extensively elaborates between surplus enjoyment and surplus value, is valid for, 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 for the epoch of modernity, or for capitalism. Of course, it doesn't, it doesn't have any any sense outside, but the the, the 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 link between alienation and production of subjectivity, on the one hand, and the link between the symbolic order and pro production of surplus, uh, is I think something that that uh, touches upon upon a limit. Not a limit between historical and ahistorical, but between two historical frameworks, and that there is a metamorphosis taking place. So the metamorphosis of the surplus object and the metamorphosis of uh, of, uh, of alienated subjectivity in a historical predicament, or in in the in the transition from one historical predicament into the other. I think one can one can demonstrate this in. Uh, 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 Marx's chapter on primitive accumulation, where the question is precisely the, gen the historical genesis of the capitalist alienated subjectivity and the capitalist version of the surplus object. So the generation of a symbolic order in which we talk about the proletarian and the, the uh, and uh, surplus value as the products uh, uh, of this historically determined symbolic order. Uh, so I think I, I think alienation uh, in itself is an empty concept. I mean, because an empty concept because it's uh, because it needs a historical framing. It, it's not like homo economicus, the assumption of a transhistoric human essence. One cannot say homo economicus is the subject of the unconscious, or homo economicus is the proletariat. It doesn't make sense because because it doesn't have, it doesn't relate to to a something. It's assumed as a as as, as, as a transhistoric human essence, um, and. Uh, um, well, greed would be the defining feature here. E or greed. Greed. greed, greed, or or what what Marx calls drive of enrichment. Mm -hmm. The chromatistics. Yeah, yeah, chromatistics. Uh, 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 as if it's the same issue in chromatistics and in capitalist economies. It's it's not. It's 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 not. But the point that. Uh, the ahistorical, if you want, point, or the, the historical point that connects different historical uh, regimes and symbolic orders that, that Lacan does make is, and I think this is a Marxist, or, or at least compatible with Marxism, uh, 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 would be that there is no symbolic order without production of a problematic surplus. That's also his point that there is no language that would be merely communicating. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, just just yeah, one sure. sentence. They're not like you have, for instance, uh, uh, this kind of reading uh, that uh, 
in communist or in socialist real, real socialism. You have you have an excess of fetishization of of persons in order to to kind of. Uh, 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 what do you mean fetishization? fetishization of persons? What is fetishization it? of persons instead of fetishization of economy, uh, of economy, of, of, of uh, commodities or, you know, like uh, economic abstractions mm -hmm. that, kind of, that, that kind of supplemented the uh, fetishism of, of, of economic abstractions. So, mm -hmm. you know, Zizek makes this point uh, in Sublime Object of Ideology. That, mm -hmm. You know, this is where you can pinpoint, you know, Cult of personality, you know, father oh, okay. of the nation, all this bullshit, uh, 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 is is ultimately ultimately a demonstration mm -hmm. of not I wouldn't say fetishist afterlives, uh, yes, uh, uh, I understand but a different a different yeah, fetishism I, that I, also exists in capitalism. But you know, uh, may I add to this? Well, this is again the point. Like it had fetishism, it had surplus language, surplus. Uh, yes, but I would uh, like to make one point. Um, well, first of all, you very beautifully described this split between thinking and being mm -hmm. when you were talking about capital and how it is becoming signification. And um, I think that uh, this split exactly into things and into speculation was the main trauma for the post-communist condition. Simply because, I mean, of course, only idiot can claim that alienation can be redeemed. I mean, we are born and we are alienated already by birth. So all those traumatic things, uh, uh, they are part and parcel of it. But the question is, in to, uh, what do you do with this uh, uh, term of alienation? How you deal with it, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, if you take the ontognosiology that takes place after revolution, and my point was that exactly due to this ontognosiology of, well, let's connect thinking and being, let's connect uh, the sign, uh, the, the use value and the thing, so exactly to this illusion maybe, mm -hmm. but in a certain sense, uh, excessive hope that this is happening, there was this um, total new philosophic ontognosiology, which was constructing out of Marx some kind of new material idealist Marxist metaphysics mm. in a way, which is claiming that from now on, uh, 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 this uh, uh, exactly Cartesian split into speculation and uh, extension can be somehow transformed, and you can use here Hegel, Marx, Spinoza. So these are the tools to make the, this montage and to bring about uh, a new condition. See, that's why this Spinoza uh, part. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this Spinoza part. Uh, but, uh, what line? <laughs> uh, but, uh, but then again, uh, Zizek's point about inevitable alienation is true, definitely, because, well, socialist. Um, Zizek is always picking out all those deviations of socialism and claiming, mm -hmm. look, I mean, ideology, um, yeah, liberalism is ideology, but communist ideology is total perversion. Yes, that is true, but perversion is shadow. This is very important because you have this dvaya media, two worldliness, two worlds, mm -hmm. double worldliness. So in one world, uh, you have uh, functioning of all parameters in the shadow world, which is absolutely kind of inexistent and criminal. Mm. So you have all those things functioning in criminal world, but this criminal world is again, is again as, as I said, the hell that topologically doesn't exist. Mm. So what exists is only uh, uh, the effectuated uh, construction and uh, uh, all those shadow things are kind of non, not quite the world. Uh, yeah, yeah, at least that. Sorry, I mean, uh, my quick question was going to be, what does a communist psyche or a communist subject look like? And yeah, that's not true. Quick I'll give what you're just saying, just one more thing. Is imagining the division of labor, I mean, I'm not sure I would, would call myself a communist, but imagining the division of labor is condition being a communist, you know, so, you know, that's communism, 
abolishing the one, you know, abolishing the family, abolishing the division of labour. So if we can't imagine that, then we're not doing communism, so we're not Marxists, so we the relationship between Marxism and communism, so none of these questions would arise. I mean, it's, that's sort of like, that's the problem, I think. You know, it's like, if going back to alienation, I mean, you're both saying, you know, we're aiming at a system with less alienation or something better, otherwise we're increasing human suffering. Mm. So, you know, I don't know, that's, that's the kind of crux of the problem. Yeah, Psychoanalysis yeah. seems to imply, which I agree with, a sort of minimum of human suffering, no. at the same time as the communist or Marxist thinking seems to imply we can alleviate yeah. that suffering. You know, otherwise, you know, why would we be that? Why would we just be enjoying what we've got? You know, and that's the right wing Nietzschean yeah, yeah, yeah. peace and critique. Yeah, yeah. You're whining, you know, you're just communists. So I just, you know, yeah, you're just just whining about crazy things. Of yeah, you're you're disadjusted, you're deviants, yeah. uh, and you're projecting your own deviancy onto the fact you can't get on in a capitalist system. No, I mean, so, yeah. if, I may, if I may just uh, uh, briefly uh, 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 respond, I mean, of course, uh, the, that's why I'm also uh, saying, you know, like. It appears more rational to me, yeah. you know, to go to go in the direction of. Uh, well, we clearly see the problem uh, that also uh, constructions of non-alienated subjectivities have very alienating consequences and can actually anchor mm. and cement uh, uh, relations of exploitation and and exhaustion, uh, like. You know, for more common because it doesn't function anymore. But you know, it has been precisely an imperative of, of de-alienated subjectivity to be forcefully socially implemented with oh, alienating with alienating consequences. Mm. You know, you mean the socialist be mobile, based on the be, uh, yeah, yeah, just uh, follow follow the greed, be the good greedy subject that you naturally are anyway. We, you know, fully actualize your human essence. I'm caricaturizing vulgar mm -hmm. uh, neoliberal economics, but you know, uh, uh, greed is good imperative uh, 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 that you know functions only for those on top. Um, but you know, I, I mean, that, that's why I think it's more a question of yes, short circuiting, disrupting the fact that we live in a system that is, I mean. Yes, it's, it's increasing alienation because alienation is the ultimate anchoring point of exploitation. It's it's a nexus yeah. of alienation and exploitation that yeah. is at stake. And you know, you don't have to live in capitalism to have this nexus. Mm. You can find it elsewhere in history or elsewhere in the present. But what I have a problem with is this. Uh, you know, that's why I can't really find share the fondness with the uh, Soviet Marxists. This fabrication of fantasies that are fabricated under, I mean, within the horizon, within the horizon determined by capitalism, whether they're made in, in, in the Soviet mm -hmm. context or not, does not matter. They are fabricated in a historic context when the capitalist imaginary still determines the global frame, the capitalist symbolic order. Is, is, I don't is, understand is, is, why. It, it, it is not, you don't have the evidences in art and production. Capitalist uh, uh, imaginaries uh, are the, are uh, remain to be imaginaries, but they are some kind of on the outskirts and uh, on the marginality of, of this construction. Well, when you are saying that you have the same alienation, the same exploitation in socialist context, I would not agree, because what I want to say that is alienation is more bearable than non-alienation. I'm not saying that mm. you can you can have, a, uh, um, I mean, that de-alienation is good, but no. what I'm saying is that uh, socialism is an overdose of non-alienatedness. Maybe it also contains forms of alienation, but it has the dose and overdose of non-alienation which has not been bearable. So the question is how to alienate more, how to have more alienation, then to, to bear no. this not this is non alienated. Just as a point so, of clarification. Because, <laughs> yeah. 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 because, because the superstructure no. is 
uh, working artificially as non -linear linear. But that's that's so can I come uh, <laughs> I think the clarification that someone has to say. In whatever you want to call it, um, historical communism, actually existing socialism, or whatever, the mm. terminology is not, not, not particularly uh, uh, relevant. But I, I just want to maybe to pinpoint what do you mean by, you know, because of course we can work with very different definitions mm. of alienation psychic definitions, economic mm. ones, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, without giving it a positive or negative valence, you know, like ideology. So, so when you say that there is an excess of non-alienation in a socialist context, mm -hmm. what kind of social relations or phenomena are you referring to that would be non-alienated in that sense? Because I can... Well, uh, for instance, the condition when even the uh, conditions of poverty are not regarded as the conditions of poverty, but they are regarding the con con conditions of a satisfactory plenitude. But by whom? By everyone. So, for instance, if you take one and the same interior... But this isn't actually like... Yeah, in, actually, in the Soviet yeah, Union in the yeah, 1960s, people yeah, didn't think they were yeah, poor. Yeah, but what... <coughs> yes, they didn't think that they were poor. They, they were, well, well, they... Or, or they were satisfied. They were satisfied. That's the point. So but when, what, what is the... Okay. So you have this equality in poverty and interiors and textures of poverty which by capitalist subjects are taken as poverty, as less. <coughs> so there is this libidinal desire to improve it, to find new phantasms of uh, just enriching this very... this absolute squalor of being. Mm. But what for capitalist subject is a squalor and misery of being for the subject of the um, uh, socialist consumer, even if he's finding, oh, I like this and this and this, he is not invested into this uh, libidinal urge of lacking something within this pleroma of poverty. And this is completely different perspective to understand that poverty is not poverty. But this is poverty for a capitalist subject. Even if one were to accept that, that's a different issue. That would be a different issue than alienation. Yes, no, no, it's not a different issue of alienation because what is this poverty about? This poverty is about a distributive construction of economy, which is artificially equalizing all the consumers. But well, we know it isn't. I mean, Soviet Union is a very stratified society well, by... I mean, politically stratified, which is a very different... I mean, I think this is the interesting yeah, issue. Stratified, but they, look, what is the stratification? It's the basic need uh, uh, remuneration. Totally basic need and remuneration. And the difference between uh, uh, stratification is like two or three times, not hundred times, as you have in capitalism. So, I mean, um, uh, I, I lost my thread, but... But, um, but this is, I mean, I, I wanted to get into the difference between the, the, the quantitative arguments and the qualitative arguments. So you can, I mean, this is what I meant quality by... Quality and quality are but By definitions of alienation. So if you have a society in which social difference and social power is politically allocated, which is the case in, I think, all actually existing social yeah. societies, mm -hmm. it's a political alienation of power and a differential allocation of goods, you know, Mm -hmm. Bluntly put, who gets the dash over the holidays, who does not, who's a good worker, mm -hmm. who does not, who no, controls... This is shadow what, economy. But, 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 but that political alienation, that, that political allocation, you could say, so you could, you know, by a certain definition of alienation, you could say feudal society is not alienated because I know why I'm a serf, and I know why he's a mm -hmm. lord, and I know I will always be a serf, and it's not alienated in the sense that there is no mm -hmm. mystification about this relation other than, mm -hmm. let's say, it's imposed by God, but usually it's just a kind of realism. Yeah, yeah. Kind of <laughs> but in that sense, we're talking about something that's not alienation, but it's not a positive definition of something yeah, that's not alienation. I guess, may I say means. something? Yeah. When Marx is de describing the commodity, he's saying that the commodity has this um, uh, pervandent uh, uh, construction, so it is... Uh, existing due to radical alienation of labor, of production, of existence, but it seems to be cozy. So a capitalist production sustains exactly because being alienated, it produces non-alienated images of beauty, of comfort. 
Here you have the other way around. Right. You have non... So what I'm saying, the common good, the non-alienation, mm -hmm. is bringing the conditions which look alienated for the capitalist subject. Okay. Though I nevertheless, want to answer, yeah. nevertheless, they are... That's why I say non-alienation is hardly and in a difficult well, way non-bearable because it brings the outcomes and perspectives and images which are much more looking like an alienation, but in their core they are due to uh, de-alienating um, uh, moduses. So what happens when we in, uh, persevere in this de-alienation? We come to, uh, to the uncanny constructions which for capitalist subject are the, uh, are the images of terrible misery. Sorry, there was one back there first. Um, I just want to make a uh, comment about the um, unconscious and socialist realism, uh, which was the kind of literature of the so really existing socialism. And uh, it seems to me that um, uh, there is a... Um, how should I start this? Uh, okay. Um, about the socialist economy and uh, the persistence of whatever you want to call it, the shadow economy or the uh, uh, capitalist elements within the, the, the really existing socialism. And it seems to me that in social, uh, basically, um, I'll start this because it's quite uh, uh, succinct, but uh, Andrzej Danov in his uh, infamous uh, manifesto for the uh, socialist realism, he said that uh, under the um, uh, new system, uh, all exploitative uh, economic relations have been eliminated, and therefore that mm. there is a new uh, subject, which is the uh, new man in the English translation that I read, um, uh, and that the only struggles that they are to be uh, exist, they exist in the new society is the construction of socialism on one side, so it's the uh, struggle of man versus nature, and the other one is the struggle against the, what he refers to the remnant of the uh, petty bourgeois mentality. So there is a, like a, this famous phrase where he says that the consciousness of the people lacks behind the transformation in the material basis. But the problem is that, so this was in 1932, 1934, in the early 30s when this was come up. But if one reads the literature uh, up to uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the struggle against um, uh, petty bourgeois mentality persists. It's a continuous element. So it has never been uh, overcome. Now, this is what I see that the, exactly the, uh, where the psychoanalysis, a psychoanalytical interpretation will help because it's, uh, it shows that this is the, repress, the return of the repressed, this petty bourgeois mentality. Sure. Now, we, the repression of the system, on the one hand, created this kind of new subject, let's say, although even their alienation was deeply rooted in the creation of the, this, like, in, for example, there is this. Uh, uh, novel um, uh, uh, How the Steel Was Tempered yes. uh, with Korchagin, I think is the name of the Ostrovsky, yes. And basically there what happened is that the new subject, which is uh, Korchagin, basically he it's completely alienated from his own body. He's taken over by his uh, communist mentality and by the end of the novel his body, because he basically destroys his body in his dedication to the cause of the revolution. So he sacrifices, you could say, the, that body for... But the thing is that his, uh, his uh, uh, subjectivity becomes more and more fierce. So that's the metaphor of the, uh, how the... Still was the of of the, yeah. So basically the alienation there, it's, it's real. The, the, between the superstructure and the base in a sense. Um, um, what, the, the, let me sorry, finish. Yeah. So, but, um, so th what I think it happened is that the question of social realism uh, to interpret that remains 
how to whatever we uh, um, uh, how to say uh, um, posit the ontology of the uh, the repressed wherever there is this old uh, idea that sexuality and uh, a, a fully constituted subject is repressed or a more constructivist one that the actual discourses of power construct the subject of the, re, uh, of the repressed, uh, the persistence of the petty bourgeois subjectivity that it constantly has to be struggled against, it looks like it's a product of the socialist discourse of power. So it's, it seems to me that the alienation was embedded within the discourse of uh, socialist realism. Uh, well, uh, good observation, but um, I, I think definitely, uh, well, first of all, I wouldn't agree that in Karchagin his idea is alienation from the body. On the contrary, um, uh, it's a little bit, well, it's, it's not the classical stupid socialist realist novel, so it, it is a specific piece and I would rather compare it to Platonov's literature, which is not this hardcore, uh, formalized, and Stalinist, uh, stupid uh, socialist realism. Therefore, I would say that um, here, as I, no uh, as I noted before, the question is not of alienating idea from the body, but rather this other determined non-self. It's the non-self issue. It's, it's this situation that when you deal with the situation that um, uh, the split between, uh, um, well, the dialectics of every identity is not nominal, but it has to be uh, constantly posited as the, as the other self, uh, and in the dialectics of the othering, and this is part and parcel of all philosophic and psychological issues, then you understand why everything is first and foremost the idea. So, this is what I wanted to say. The idea is not alienated, but he decomposes himself because the body is the idea, and the idea is body. This is what I wanted to tell. That in this uh, construction, uh, uh, idea is invading body to the extent that what exists and what decomposes uh, is hard to delimit. This is the first thing. And this happens in Platonov as well. Platonov's hero, John, for instance, he, he, uh, uh, he, he is also absolutely, there is no limit of how to protect the body because there is this self-obsessive uh, idea of bringing the whole um, group to to certain goal. Um, but another thing about the petty bourgeois which is sipping through, uh, I think this petty bourgeois condition was uh, created by Stalinist um, uh, stratification of intelligentsia, of uh, actors, etc. Uh, which again, as I say, and uh, um, for instance Vladimir Sarokin shows, very, show it, shows it very well. It is not the deviation of the, of the system of the common good of communism. Stalin is himself uh, as power the deviation from the system. So it's not that the system didn't work and it contained these ideas of um, uh, alienation and deviation, but uh, 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 the, uh, the agents of the system uh, could not uh, deal with the construction of uh, common good. And therefore, if you look, the decomposition of the socialist comes from above. Because uh, my question, uh, some of you uh, answered my question to a certain degree, you moved in that direction, but then in the discussions, uh, you know, what was going <coughs> on was this uh, tension between a structural and a historical conception of alienation that it sort of led me back to my question that uh, I, I felt that it's, it's still not very clear to me that um, uh, when it comes to the subject in the psychoanalysis sexuality knowledge the knowledge or language are uh, structured around the fundamental uh, negativity or, or crack which unites them at the point of the unconscious so 
that is how they get united around the unconscious, uh, these this three elements. Um, and uh, this psychoanalytic account sort of converges with, uh, you know, accounts we get in Western philosophy or in philosophical anthropology. Like one example, there are examples, uh, but one example would be uh, Agamben's language and death, uh, where he sort of develops a relation between lang the subject or language and negativity in a philosophical manner without any recourse to psychoanalysis, uh -huh. you know. Uh, so, on the one hand, we have this conception of the subject that is general and, and uh, universal and trans historical, as you said, you know. And even in Aristotle, even though I uh, completely agree with uh, what you said about Aristotle, what, even in Aristotle, the difference between primary qualities and secondary qualities is very much uh, what in modern linguistics is considered as a, a, a difference between uh, indication and demonstration or signification, you know, that where language uh, announces itself as an event and then the moment of meaning, which there is a gap between these two moments where you have language simply as an event and then the moment of demonstration or signification or, or in Lacan like uh, long and peril or uh, so, uh, you know, uh, primary qualities, you know, table, Three and this table, this tree. When you use shifters and shifters in a Hegelian way, bring in the element of temporality, mm -hmm. and therefore that's where the subjects uh, basically plays a role. So, so, so you see this this uh, idea of of uh, originary negativity or crack in language is very old, uh, even in a way it goes back to Aristotle. So. On the one hand, we get this in psychoanalysis, which is very much compatible with, with, with this account. But on the other hand, as, as uh, you know, that was the subject of your talk, and uh, even uh, you connected, uh, you know, the theorization of alienation to the Cartesian cogito, and then we see that for Lacan, the subject of the unconscious is a Cartesian subject. So it's uh, so the importance of unconscious is still seems very historical and modern to me, and. Um, I still, it's not very clear to me how these two moments are reconciled. You know that that modern Cartesian historical moment and and the you know the metaphysical mm. uh, moment that runs through the history of uh, Western philosophy. Well, but, I mean they, they are not reconciled even in the present. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, in a way. Uh, <clears throat> That's also <clears throat> the point that I like about uh, Jean-Jacques Lesserte's uh, book on philosophy or research on, on philosophy of language, uh, where he basically shows that there is something like a persistence. I mean, that in a way we are all Aristotelians in the sense that, uh, that, 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 that we relate to language in a tool-like uh, 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 manner and uh, communica communicational model. And, you know, Lacan is not saying that this is not happening in language. Uh, you, you mentioned long, uh, langage and parole. Uh, they only exist in fusion. They only exist in the long, written together. You cannot have pure speech that wouldn't, that wouldn't you know, that would be detached from the body. You cannot have pure language that would be completely functional. So Lacan introduces the, the, I mean, this focus on, uh, on, on, on the in-betweenness between these two, these, these two poles. And in, ultimately, it's only the mix. And it's only the, it only contains the tension within it, in a way you know, we're talking about uh, dualism and, and uh, monism, and it, it is a conflicted monism. It's not a dualism. Uh, Lacan is not a dualist. Um, um, and I mean, I, I'm aware, of course, that, that, that in Aristotle, before you enter metaphysics, you have to invent the ideal language which functions, which is capable of describing stable being. 
Um, and again, I'm not saying that this does not exist, but uh, Lacan, or yeah, well, Freud and Lacan uh, in particular, inverts the, the perspective and posits on the, the point from which the gaze on language is, uh, is thrown to, uh, uh, to the problematic of instability, or for, from the problematic of instability. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that structure and history stand up, fall apart, you know, because he said at, at the beginning something that made me think as if, you know, I assume the position where these two poles are, are opposite. For Lacan, they're not. <laughs> Uh, for, 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 for Lacan, you cannot uh, detach structure from, uh, from, from, its, uh, uh, historical, from its historical transformations, because otherwise you, couldn't, you wouldn't be able to talk about clinics. Okay. I take one final question. Okay. Um, I Sorry, I didn't mean to load your question with a finality. <laughs> yeah, it was just uh, yeah. <laughs> It has to be one after mine. Yeah, no. um, just uh, thank you both for brilliant papers, and I'm just going to touch on a few things. Uh, I want to just take up this question of the optic difference, um, this different kind of geometry and choreography, and the kind of suffering that's 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 uh, an effect of it. Um, and just to say that, you know, I, I don't know if I fully understood all the incredible moves that you made, but it seems to me it's quite close to um, what the Karl Marx in an ethics of desire that an ethics of desire is dependent on alienation, and that you know, the economy and service of goods literally mm. plugs up um, the topological space, where, which is the place of death, which is the lack of being, which is the feminine, the not all, in other words. And in the, in the ethics, when he's mapping um, how not to give ground on desire, the Kant places um, Marx as quite conservative. He places him in the field of the, of, of the logic of the economy and service of goods. And says, because Lacan, uh, if Marx plugs that topological place, which is necessary for desire, which is the not all, mm -hmm. he switches it up by thinking that everything can be faced by distributing goods in an equal way across the surface of the earth. So he returns it to the economy and service of goods. And so you never get to face desire, because you have to undeceive that as an ethics of desire. And I sort of feel that's what's at stake in, in what you unpack today, and the kind of suffering, uh, when you're actually deprived of desire, because everything is being sutured up in terms of a notion of the common good and an equal distribution of goods. And you remain in the uh, sutured up space. So that's just a response to you and a response mm, yes, to a great comment. It's not a question, it's a wonderful thank comment. You. And thank you for thank this you. reference. Oh, thank you. And then just one other in relation to Alberto's question to you. Um, he asked, you know, what would it be to um, sort of cleave, uh, if, I, if I understood it correctly, what would it be to open up uh, fantasy and capitalism? And I thought it would have to be the act. Mm. You know, it would have to be what Lacan, what's at stake in the act, which takes you from the bad infinite to the transitive, transitive infinite of the of the not all. Mm. It would have to be that kind of ethical act, um, which is a destruction, creation, ex nihilo kind mm. of moment. Mm. That's what I, I I think as a response to, to um, Alberto's question. I don't know if you agree with that. I, I, I think uh, uh, what, uh, we should leave it with this remark, because yes, I mean, uh, of course, I, uh, I, yeah, it's I agree with what you were saying. <laughs> yeah, fantastic comment. Fantastic comment, because I, I think it's, it's incredible that you gave me this reference. <laughs> and then also brought in the, the reference to Lacan's theory of, of action. And the act, yeah, yeah, well, which I mean, is the yeah, non-derisory yeah. crossing of the limit, yeah. which is non-pacificatory and changes all the coordinates and the topology of what is, yeah. whether that be at the level of revolution or at the subject. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, if yeah, I may, yeah. I would, I would uh, add something to this. Uh, I think Lacan's theory of the act, uh, nevertheless, I, I would think it in pair with, uh, with, the, with the question of Durchschlag, of working through yes. in, in Freud. The act has transformative consequences only insofar as it triggers and sustains a labor. Yes. And, and labor is, yes. is, is for Freud 
and for Marx and for well, others, uh, something that defines uh, whether a social li link is exploitative or non-exploitative. It's like the value of infidelity. Well, for, 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 but, for but you, yeah, yeah, the process of truth was, I think, uh, Dominic Kuhn's and Ed Plut, uh, uh, were, were, were tre uh, um, comparing it with, uh, with the truth, um, truth procedure with working through. Yeah. Okay, well, on that uh, uh, note, uh, join me in thanking our speakers.